is mm -hmm. the 50th anniversary of the college. And as we look back and honor our, our history and our legacy, we also want to look forward to what um, this college can continue to do and the place and role it has in this community. It is a gem. Uh, and I, I like to tell people, if you live to be 50, hmm. everyone except this beautiful <laughs> young, and perhaps this person, these two people uh, <laughs> have lived to be 50. Yeah, probably in that category. 50, if you live to be 50, you have had ups and downs in your life, right? But uh, we all hope and pray the ups have been much more often than the downs. And that is the case with Roxbury Community College. This is our community college, um, and we are honored to be able to celebrate 50 years and look forward to the next 50-plus um, years of this uh, great institution. So as part of the 50th anniversary we, year, we have had a series of community dialogues on important issues uh, facing our community, <coughs> Uh, that the college is involved and engaged uh, with in terms of our work and our teaching and our scholarship. And health care and health equity is critical uh, to this community, to um, a thriving community. And we are just honored that you're with us uh, this morning as we think about issues uh, impacting health care in this community. Health equity and workforce are two very critical components of delivery of health care. We're not going to talk about delivery this morning as much as we're going to talk about those two issues. Um, I want to just start by introducing two of our deans who, are, who lead our health care work here at Roxbury Community College. Uh, dean Sal Pina, uh, who leads our workforce and Dean Gloria Cater, who leads our nursing program. Mm -hmm. um, nursing, um, the, as many of you may know, the governor um, put, um, I think it was 14 million or 10 million in the budget. Mm -hmm. So nursing is critical. You can go to nursing school here at Roxbury Community College pretty much free. So please, if you know people who are interested in nursing, uh, Dean Gloria Cater would love to talk to you and talk to them. <laughs> we have a, this morning, uh, what we hope is to have a dialogue. Uh, we are not going to have a lot of presentations. We really want to talk about uh, health equity and health workforce issues and their impact um, in our community. And so we have um, four phenomenal, phenomenal um, panelists that will have a conversation. And we want to encourage you to dialogue with us. So we're just going, I'm going to ask each panelist just a very short, brief uh, question, and then we're going to open it up for conversation. Does right. that make sense? Right. Makes sense. <laughs> we're looking forward um, to that, <clears throat> that conversation. Um, our first uh, panelist is represents the health equity compact. Where's Lindsay? <laughs> Lindsay is there. Our what's your title, Lindsay? To introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for being with us, Lindsay, and the important work you're doing. So we have two. Are you all board members or We're members? Members. We're members. members of the health We're equity members. compact, Dr. Claire Pierre and Dr. Charles Anderson. Good um, from um, my, my Demick community, <laughs> Demick, oh, the right. Demick Center, not the Community <laughs> Health Center. Um, we'll start with, with uh, Claire and Dr. Anderson. Um, what, what do you think are the most critical issues that this group needs to be talking about this morning? Uh, and you all can talk a little bit about the work of the Health uh, Equity Compact. Sure. Let me, um, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and, and have a conversation about something that's really critical to all of us. And when I say critical to all of us, what I mean is that when we talk about issues of health equity, we're really talking about those ways that we make sure that every individual in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has access, not only in terms of physical access, 
because it's one thing to have a hospital right next door to you. It's another thing to feel that that hospital is approachable and that you're gonna be cared for in a way that allows you to continue to come back and get what those resources are there to provide you. Let me tell you just a brief story because I think this helps and it's gonna be very brief, but I think it helps illustrate this point. I'm the president and CEO at the Demick Center. We care for about 19,000 people, primarily in Roxbury, where there's this huge difference in life expectancy of over 20 years between someone living in Roxbury and just a couple miles away in the Back Bay. Every week, every day, I hear stories that emphasize the importance of this. I'm gonna tell you one from just three days ago. We had a gentleman come into our detox. One third of the detox beds for the city of Boston are on this beautiful campus right down the street here at the Demick Center. This gentleman came in and through his experience with us, he was clearly getting better in terms of the physical parts of his detoxification, but there was still something else going on with him. And he met with several people and could not really find the opportunity to share what was required to really get to the outcomes that he needed. He then met one of our behavioral health workers who actually spoke his language, who he connected with because this person looked like him and he could engage with. And he went on to describe the fact that in the last three weeks, he tried to take his life twice. That's information that transformed his care that otherwise would not have been received because of this issue of making sure that we have a system in place that sees him, hears him, just like anyone else. So we've come together as a group of over 80 black and brown professionals in the state to say, look, these are critical issues when we talk about the impact of health care on not only individuals but the entire system we need to make sure that we're pushing the state to understand that these gaps in care that are related to the things that i hear every day that really highlight the need for a more equitable system are addressed so i'm proud to be part of this i'm going to let claire talk a little bit more about the compact and our genesis Pierre, is it on now? Yes. Ah, good. I'm Claire Pierre, and I'm a member of the Health Equity Compact, and I focus on um, community health in my day-to-day -day work. And I have to say that bringing together leaders of color across the private industry, the healthcare industry, insurance companies, philanthropy, is not just about having multiple people in the room. It's about having a lot of expertise aligned around one thing. And we've known about health equity for a long time. There have been studies after studies showing that people are dying, like literally, um, meaning lives lost, families who are missing someone every single day. And yet many of us were, didn't know about each other and we weren't coming together to organize our voices into one platform that clearly identifies priorities. And so I think the first part was having this compact bring us together and then realizing that these, what we're living now, the results that we're seeing now, came from organized policies, came from organized investments, came from structural decisions. And so we therefore have to counter them with similar processes. And so we worked on a bill, um, and we're, I know you're gonna tell us more about that. Um, but we're also looking at the whole health system, not just what policies we need, but also who are the people that should be there so that when a patient comes in, they can see the diversity and expertise that the state has to offer, that the city has to offer in every level of a health system, right? And then we think about how payment is made. You know, a lot of why we do things is because of how we get paid in the health system. So are the payments made in ways that actually encourage people to deliver care that's equitable? So the Health Equity Compact is truly a forum that advocates for structural change and realizes that there's urgency now so that we don't spend our time just talking about the data but actually move towards action. That's great. Um, you know, when I worked more closely in healthcare, we didn't have the health equity compact. We didn't have the incredible leadership that we have in uh, Senator Liz Miranda. Um, the sad thing for me is the data hasn't changed much in 20 years. 
many, many years, <laughs> all you young people in the room, <laughs> in many, many decades. Um, doctors, what, what do you think we in this room can talk about so that when we come back 10 years from now, um, the numbers aren't the numbers that we're seeing. All of the indices have not um, moved very much. And it's, um, it's very frustrating because Boston is the mecca of healthcare. We, people come from all over the world to get their health care here in Boston, and yet we can't make a dent. What, 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 what do we need to, what do we in this room need to think about and talk about? Um, what, what I was saying is that especially in this room, in this amazing institution at this stage, we should be talking about these issues of workforce. We really, really should be talking about this because, and I'm being more than just talking about it, we should be really acting on it. Because there are opportunities right now, we look at the just significant shortage in workforce and healthcare. This is such an amazing opportunity to build that workforce up in a way that it hasn't been built private, prior, prior to this. This is the opportunity for us to really talk about and to get to these why, right? We see these disparities and we have study after study to show that when you have concordance in race and ethnicity between provider and the individual, that there's a different and better outcome. So I'd say in this room, we should be really, really coming up with ways to accelerate our process in terms of how we structure a healthcare workforce that better meets the needs and really fills that gap around equity. Because this is an institution where you've got individuals who are coming here who want to do amazing things in our communities. Let's make sure that we create pathways for individuals to do that. I'd love for us to have a part of this dialogue to really explore how we do that together. That's good. Dr. Pierre, do you want to add, do you want to add anything to that? I couldn't agree more, and I think the biggest thing for us maybe also to break the mold in the way we do this, these pathways, what, whatever we're doing now is great. Individually, as different academic institutions, we're separate. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't work together. We don't deliver shared degrees. Very rarely do we have shared paths that allows people to go from one to another. Um, as hospitals, we can probably do better in terms of training and being more deliberate about that. Uh, we have weird, weird, weird rules, like some jobs require a degree and some mm -hmm. jobs. So do they really require that? What is the function that's needed? Mm -hmm. And can you bring people along where they are? And so I think it will have to be in addition to what you're saying, to implement the recommendations we're making, we all have to really decide that it's unacceptable that the workforce is not as diverse as it could be. Well, how do we shed our identities and collaborate so that we can get to that goal? That's fantastic. And you, you talked earlier about policy and structural changes. We are incredibly fortunate to have had a state rep and now the, our senator who cares deeply about these issues and not just from a theoretical point of view but from a personal, uh, from her own personal life, lived life experiences. And um, Senator Miranda is tackling these issues at structural and policy levels. So Senator, do you want to talk a little bit about your the proposed legislation? Yes, can you guys hear me? I think I turned it on. Okay, Roxbury Lizzie's gonna come out. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here. Um, I'm gonna take a point of privilege to, to talk a little bit about how I came to actually this work and why I'm so proud to be one of four filers and the main Senate filer of the Health Equity Compact. Um, so in 2017, I was born and raised in this community. I went to John D. O'Brien, went to Wellesley, came back and spent maybe 15 years in nonprofit leadership, youth development, community organizing, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I had my dream job. I was running a community center up the hill called the Hawthorne. And uh, I was able to work with youth workers across the city. And my brother went to a nightclub and never came home. And uh, Michael wasn't the first person that had lost to gun violence. And actually, when Michael was killed, I thought in my mind how many funerals that I had gone to and like when was my first friend. And then I remembered uh, my high school classmate, Michael Tavares, was my neighbor. We went to kindergarten through high school together. 
Um, he had been shot on Copeland Street the summer I came back from Wellesley and just was sitting with this 18 years of growing up in the Dudley Triangle. We had to fight so much. We were already an EJ community um, that fought back and got control over our land. You know, growing up, I had 1,400 parcels of vacant land. I grew up in a household where my mom was a teen immigrant mom who worked in a hotel as a cook, um, who dropped out of Madison Park High School to have me. My father and all my male siblings were incarcerated. And I was living in this space where I'd finally arrived. I did everything that I was supposed to do, right? You go to college, you come back, you give back. Um, and I still wasn't able to save my brother. Um, so six months after that, I decided to run for office, really pushed. Um, I said no, like in seven different languages. <laughs> Hell no. Uh, I didn't think women like me, um, even though I had to look, you know, I got to live a life where Charlotte Gola Ritchie was my state rep. And I just want to say thank you so much for inspiring me. Her leadership, her radiance when she would walk into a room mm -hmm. was something that I had been inspired by, but I still didn't feel adequate enough. Um, but I run, I win, and I get to the state house. I don't know how to write a bill, but I was committed um, to work on gun violence. And in the first week on the job, I hear a presentation from March of Dimes about the maternal health crisis. And um, it basically, in short, told me that I was going to die giving birth. <laughs> you know, as a black woman, I already came to the state house with all this drama. And then they tell me that the 10 were zip codes in the Commonwealth, six of them were in the city of Boston. The others were Bristol County, Holyoke, Chicopee. Um, these are all places that I was familiar with. And I walked out of that room <clears throat> and then remembered that there was other traumas based on my sister giving birth to a child that didn't survive, um, my friend having to have a doula, that she paid thousands of dollars for this doula because she was going through the process alone, uh, my other friend who had birth trauma and was sent home even though she told her doctor she wasn't feeling well. Uh, by the time she was allowed to come back to the hospital, realized that they had made uh, an incision. Um, they had basically cut her intestines when they were doing their, her C-section. And so all of this stuff was just coming to me in the elevator. And I was like, as a black woman, I know I came to the state house for gun violence, um, but I couldn't not work on that issue. I wasn't a doctor. I didn't know anything. I didn't think I knew anything about health. Um, and then COVID-19 happened. And so you can imagine being a freshman legislator, uh, a, a lot of pressure on your shoulders to come in and do something. You know, we have to be excellent as black women, right? You know, I had, Wellesley wasn't enough. So I had to go out and show out. I had to pass some bills. I was gonna learn how to write legislation. And I was gonna work on the two issues that really were connected to my lived experience through my siblings and through my environmental issues. And fast forward, I was appointed to a task force. And this task force was studying the impact of COVID-19 in our communities. And we had a listening session. All of, we had multiple listening sessions. But when the report was done, and this is something that we all should pay attention because it's not about implicit bias. It's about explicit bias. There's just racism, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, we need to stop avoiding this. And the other thing we need to stop doing is making, making Massachusetts more exceptional than it really is. Because this exceptionalism, this idea that we are the best, is not allowing us to actually fix the problems, the, the deep-rooted problems that, that we actually have. And the task force was done. This report was created. I worked a lot on pieces of uh, the carceral system and health equity. And it just was on a shelf. Mm -hmm. It was almost like the report didn't happen. It was almost like we didn't do hundreds of hours of listening sessions and, and did this report. Because what was in there was truth. Mm -hmm. And it's very scary to tell the government, like, you're not good at this, 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 and this, and you need to be paying attention to incarcerated individuals and our, our EJ communities. And those were two things that were uplifted in that report. And so Michael Curry was uh, one of the people on that um, task force. And he and I talked often over the next couple of years about like, what are we gonna do about this? We had all this good data. Mm -hmm. And so in January of this year, after winning my Senate race, which was really tough. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I've been running 50-yard dashes my whole life. Um, 
they came to us, Rasky Partners and some folks came to us and said, we have a bill and we'd like you, um, the representative of Springfield, the senator of um, Lawrence and the rep of Chelsea, because these are the communities that were really impacted uh, by some of the things that we got in our report to file this huge bill called the Health Equity Compact. And, and I'll get more into that as we go along, but really the point of the compact is we really have to transform health and healthcare in the Commonwealth. We are not the best. Um, even in maternal health, where we talk about um, that Massachusetts has the best public health infrastructure, uh, the best hospitals, biotech, life sciences, entrepreneurial sector that rivals the West Coast, the report just came out, not only has it not improved, not only has it stayed the same, but the Department of Public Health said it's worsened for black women. Mm -hmm. Morbidity and mortality among black birthing people has actually doubled in the last decade in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And although we have the lowest number of gun deaths and we have the toughest gun laws, that doesn't matter to families like mine because the 200 plus people that die at the hands either of a domestic homicide, community violence, suicide, police violence, or state sanctioned violence, um, this is all happening more and more in our communities, gateway cities and cities like Boston. And so not only do we need to feel a sense of urgency, but the unity that we're seeing with the Health Equity Compact and the legislature is because reports like this are life and death. They're not meant to sit on the shelf. Uh, we've got to do something about it. We've got to act. And, and I'm really proud to file the bill in January, but actually have spent the last year. Uh, many of the, my colleagues have done these sessions all across the Commonwealth to different audiences, some healthcare providers, some business leaders, um, to just make this a priority in the legislature so that it can pass either this term or next term. Everything is very slow in government, um, but I just finished police reform uh, a year ago, which got passed in six months. So I know it's possible where there is public will and public pushing us uh, to work on something that we can actually make a difference. Thank you, Senator. Um, it You're welcome. It makes a huge difference to have someone there who life lived experiences uh, uh, matter yeah. and who can speak truth. And so we're very, very blessed and fortunate to have you. Uh, we know that when the call is out uh, around the lobbying and educating to get <laughs> yeah, this legislation yeah. passed, uh, we will all be, be there uh, in support. Um, I want to introduce our last panelist who can, the reason I saved Oz for last is because he spent 20 plus years working on these issues before they were popular uh, in large health systems at Mass General and the whole um, Partners Network. And so Oz can put some context, I think, on everything that the senator and our two doctors have beautifully spoke about and <coughs> then he's going to offer up a few questions for us to think about. He doesn't know he's doing this but <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> as we begin the conversation. So, so Oz Monta here. Well, thank you, my dear friend. And it's great to be here with you. I love this campus and the professors that teach all of you are really near and dear. We've ha I've had a relationship with Roxbury Community College for many years. We've hired from your nursing programs and other programs here, and I met Dean Salvatore today, and I met Rosario, and um, I feel like we're gonna get connected after this. Because it's the collaboration between the academic institutions and healthcare providers, that's where the magic is, and really being part of the community that was um, articulated earlier. I am so taken back by everything you've shared not only from your personal experience, but your power, the words that you choose to explain the crisis that we're in. I've made a career out of hiring the right people for the right jobs for more than years than I care to tell you about. Work is important, and if you aren't able to work, you're not able to contribute. And if you're not able to contribute, you get lost in the system. So this has been a passion of mine, and as uh, our, my dear friend here shared, for the last 20 of those years, I've been at the helm in talent acquisition. When I first started in human resources, it was called personnel. It's a long time ago. And talent acquisition was just recruiting. It's a very significant time right now. And I just recently left Mass General. 
And I think there's an opportunity here to think about how we engage the workforce in a meaningful way, especially after the COVID um, pandemic. And what I had heard earlier through a couple of comments is collaboration is key. We have to work with our competitors. We can't do it as a silo any longer. We can't hire someone today, a nurse, hire them at Mass General, and tomorrow, Dimmick Center has to compete to hire that person at a different rate. We have to work together to really align our talent. There are many, many challenges before us, and there's a lot of data. A few folks talked about that shelled report. The Healthcare Collaborative, which started in 2016, I had the opportunity to be one of the members there. And by the way, I'm a proud member of the Health Equity Compact. These folks that have been around for a while have just invited me to participate. And really what I bring to the table is not this wonderful experience I have. I wanted to bring in the disability conversation into the, into the topic. Because if you are a person of color and you have a disability, that's two, two whams are against you. So during COVID, that became very clear to me, and this is why I'm just thrilled to be part of the Health Equity Compact. So back to workforce. There was, um, I think there were about 80 folks that got together, leaders of the state, leaders of healthcare uh, providers, uh, the unions, um, the nursing uh, executives, the physicians, the clinicians, the support system of any hospital to, to really create um, the, 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 uh, to, do, to put together the data of why we're 25,000 short in nursing. That is a critical number. Actually, if you took at the, a look at the aggregate, we're about 45,000 folks that we're not filling, that are vacant positions right now. There were three areas that, came to, uh, that came, became very clear. One is uh, nurses. And it's not necessarily nurses throughout the entire state. When you're in the urban side, there's still, a, you know, we're doing, we're struggling. We're doing a lot of travelers and so on. But if you get into the more uh, suburban and rural uh, areas, it's very difficult to find uh, nursing, talented nurses to do the work. That's one area. The other area is mental health. We just don't have enough of the care providers. And we've made it particularly uh, difficult because there are so many criteria that you have to meet in order to successfully be able to be reimbursed for, the, for those services. And the third is the core, what I think of, of healthcare, and that is the folks at the bedside, the CNAs, the PCAs, the home health aides. And that is a clear pipeline to getting into nursing, to getting into social work. I have seen it. I'm a first generation, I'm Cuban American. My mother was a CNA, but before she was a CNA, she was a housekeeper. So I see the upskilling as part of that. And she never made it to, to be a nurse, but boy, she could have been a wonderful nurse if there was tuition reimbursement. The, the challenge for us to do the upskilling, there are many challenges, but one is if you're a CNA, you're at a certain level in the wage ladder. And that's a very difficult challenge because we're competing in a, in a community where not only is it very expensive to live, but retail, hotels, Lyft drivers, Ubers, they're taking that talent and they're earning more by doing that work. So our competitors are not just healthcare. I come from the hotel industry as well, and if you look at every hospital, there is a hotel in every hospital. So all those workers that support the clinicians and the researchers, it's another body of employees that we have, I'll say we still, because I still very, feel very much part of the Mass General Brigham, we have to recruit from. And the Healthcare Collaborative came up with great data, and we can share some of that. I have to say, I haven't seen, uh, I, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the Healthcare Collaborative with the workforce issue, I have not seen a lot of action. So breaking down those silos, which I think is really important, is really critical. When I think of the collaboration between campuses like RCC, the nursing leadership in these hospitals, and I think of the talent that we're losing because we're not nurturing that talent. It takes a little bit more than hand-holding than just to apply online, in my opinion. So I am here as just supporting my great, amazing new friends and colleagues here, and of course, proud to be on your campus, because I think it can be addressed. I'm not, I'm not giving up, even after all these years in, in workforce development. The state has several initiatives underway. But if you look at the Commonwealth Corporation, which I'm also a proud member of their board, there is funding there for upskilling. There is incredible amount of resources available 
But if you're a large organization, you may have the wherewithal. If you're a smaller organization, you struggle to find those connections. So when I think of health equity, the health equity compact, when I think of the workforce development, uh, collaboration and work for in, in, in the report, and I think of academic institutions. There's one other prong to it. In this industry of healthcare, we, it's, it's high touch, but boy, we've gone so high tech that we're forgetting the high touch. So I actually am here to take a little bit of a risk and say, we need to augment our human resources departments. We need to bring in folks that support folks that are going through a career ladder, that are trying to find their way, so in my history, which is a long time ago, there were folks that would check in on you to say, gee, you didn't show up for work, what's going on? You didn't get that class cleared, what happened? That takes not only funding, it takes attention. And that is part of the magic. So I'm hoping we'll have that discussion. There were several students here. There are folks that are leading the, the liaisons between the students and then the employers. And I think there's an opportunity if we break down some of those silos and really share talent. I would like to see a day when the Mass General, they might be losing a nurse because they're moving closer to the Dimmick Center where if someone picks up the phone and calls the Dimmick Center and says, hey, you wanna, you wanna call this nurse. You want to have her on your team. That is a little bit of magic that we're not there yet, but I'm still naive enough that I think it can happen. So I'm just thrilled to be here. I would love to have a discussion with you. English as a second language is a big passion of mine. So culturally competent care. If we don't hire the folks that represent the communities we serve, we don't provide the right care. And I think I'll stop there. Let's give our panel a round of applause. <laughs> Oz, I think you stopped at the, at the perfect point of who we hire. And that is something each of you talked about having people that um, look like you on the team. Um, I'm going to open it up now for um, questions, comments, dialogue. I want to say something if I can. Sure. First of all, thank you all for. Um both parents in the home, 13 of us children. So we're going back in the 50s. So I've seen the transitions going on here in the city, here in the community. Um, I wanna say that uh, with COVID, COVID changed the face of our nation. It changed every way that people think, people work, the way people operate, the people, way people communicate with each other. It sent us home to be back home with our families, not working so many jobs, all of these different things going on. One of the uh, uh, several things that I've learned from COVID um, is we have to go back into training. So everything that you all were talking about in terms of training, this needs to happen urgency across the board. Shortness of nurses, and healthcare workers and stuff, well, there's a shortness in everybody's job. Everybody, people are looking at things differently. I believe, as a creative artist, that we need to think outside the box. And I believe that while you all are collecting the data and doing the frontline work, we are supposed to be your support systems where we come together in the numbers. We have to come together. All of these have to be clicks that click together, like a link on a chain. And we need to be able to, we have breast cancer walks, we have this walk, we have that walk. We need to have a walk where all of these issues are on a piece of paper. We all have an agenda with all of these things set down so that we all know what we are in the street marching for. Because let's face it, in the 60s, it took Dr. King and all the other civil rights people to hit the streets to make things a lot better today than the way that they were. 
Many other cultures are here, and they are certainly getting the advancement of what we have fought for. And some of them look the other way when it comes to still us as black people, as a black American man, you know, I'm just being honest about all of it. We do need to come together. So I had written these things down about finding creative people that may, you know, we have people in the community. For example, I know Jackie for many years. I brought uh, to stepping out fashion for years. And when I brought fashion, I didn't only bring the adults. I brought children to a grown-up affair. And the reason why I brought the children is because we need to start there. You know, again, we're fighting things out here, and mental health and all of these things have been going on and have gotten richer and richer and richer in terms of that. When I brought these young kids, that was starting a program that I call FLS, Feel Good, Look Good, and Smell Good. It's to help our young people from 6 to 10, 11 to 14, and 15 to 21, first make sure that they have a primary care physician. Because how else are you going to be in charge of knowing about your own health personal situation? And yes, we have to go through parents to make sure that's happening, but that's a way, a segue to make these things that we're talking about on the adult level happen in a more form. Because when we focus on these young people, these are our seeds. These are our seeds. And in order for a seed to grow, you have to plant it and make sure that you're fertilizing it and watering it. So that's the nutrition that we as adults are supposed to realistically be giving. So as we groom these young people, not only in the health consciousness, we're grooming them also for their lives, which can help to combat the violence and all the other things. We have a chance to dialogue. We have a chance to be in the room together. We have a chance. We're still using old tactics and expecting different results. That's how I am seeing this. And I say this because I have had the honor to travel to every state in the United States and 100 countries. I've seen stuff. I know what I'm saying. So again, creativity is finding other people outside, maybe not even the health care, mm -hmm. but they're people in the community that bring together clusters of people. And we have to find ways to get into there and connect with these people to empower on a bigger level. That's my, that's my input. Thank you. Michael, that's, that was amazing. Any, it's uh, absolutely. <clears throat> because I think you hit on something really important. And this idea of we can't do the same things and expect different results. So as we've looked at this at the Demick Center, one of the things that we realized very quickly by talking to community, engaging, and trying to understand ways to close these gaps, it was very, very clear when I spoke to the folks at New Academy Estates that you got to involve these young people. And it allowed us to think about ways to engage young people by having young people sit down and help us figure out how to engage them. Fast forward the clock. What we did with them was they helped us develop a program to influence the way their community thought about heart health. And with a wonderful partnership with a good friend of mine, Damar and Martin, and his company, Well With All, we decided that we would train this wonderful group of young people about the basics about hypertension, right? Now you'd say, it sounds simple to talk about diastolic, systolic blood pressure, et cetera, but we really, what we really did with them is we listened and we gave them basic information and most importantly, we taught them how to take blood pressure mm -hmm. and giving them that one tool and that basic information allow them as neighbors to talk to their neighbors in these amazing interactions where they would do blood pressure screening. I talked to them recently, 
these young people were driving people crazy over there at New Academy <laughs> Estates, talking about, talking about, let's make sure your blood pressure's checked, let's make sure you're taking your medication, let's make sure you're not putting too much salt in the food. And this started with a group of eight young people aged 12 to 18. No advanced degrees, not thinking about all the certifications required, but this is how we really look at, creatively, ways to address health equity. <laughs> Let's empower people who we really haven't thought about as being part of the system before. Let's empower them with the tools required. And I already look at many of them, I see future doctors, oh, yes. nurses, <laughs> behavioral health specialists, et cetera. But that was just a pilot for us to understand how to engage young people in ways to address many of these big issues. So I thank you for that reminder um, of the importance of engaging young Can people. Can I jump in on that? I shared that I was a, a youth worker for many years, but what I didn't share was that I also was a part of amazing youth programs as a, a 14, 15, 16 year old girl in the city. And those programs really saved my life. I was a latchkey kid, my mom worked 16 hour days. And so if it wasn't for the Orchard Park Teen Center, or the Roxbury Boys and Girls Club, or My Town, or Teen Empowerment, I don't know where I would end up. Because oftentimes we don't know we can be something unless we see it. Um, and one of the major problems in our workforce today is because we haven't built the pathways and pipelines for kids that grow up in the city who attend our public schools to be able to have meaningful careers um, that they can take care of their families. We see a huge, huge, uh, issue with a high school graduation, and even in the city of Boston, and matriculation in colleges. And then you see a huge downfall in graduation rates within four to six years. And so kids from Boston are not only not choosing to go to college, but many times they're not finishing. And we can't have the Harvards and the Wellesleys and the MITs, the RCCs of the world um, here in Massachusetts and stay where world leader in education, where the Mecca, when even our own children don't get to access that. So one of my first jobs was as a peer leader. And um, this is why it's important to study explicit bias and racism. Uh, when I was in OP, I didn't live in OP, but I lived next to it. And every day I'd walk through the projects to go to O'Brien and made a lot of friends there, so I got a job there. There was a community health center in Orchard Park housing development. So for those 2,500 residents, um, many elders, many young people, they had somewhere to go right inside of the housing development to, to take their blood pressure or to, to check their eyesight. Or if there was an acute emergency, something that didn't require sort of surgery, that um, they could be there. But I also learned a lot about sexual health. And there was a lot of money in sort of anti-teen pregnancy programs. And being the daughter of a teen mom, she did the best she could. She was an amazing mother, but I didn't want to have a kid at 17. Um, I learned so much in that peer leadership program that I didn't learn at home. Kay Verdians don't talk about stuff like that. And so when you grow up, you're like, here, like we don't want to talk about reproductive issues. We don't want to talk about sex. God forbid that, right? So the idea is that like the programs not only inspire you to want to be other things, but it actually educates you. And young people teach their families. You know, we go back home and we talk to our grandparents and we talk to our parents about things that we learn. And so we know that there's a huge problem and a disconnect. And utilizing young people, I think, is a great strategy um, because we need to fill these jobs, but we don't need to just import people to fill these jobs. We have uh, great young people and young adults in our city. And mid-career people that want to change careers, that's the other thing, that there's a lot of 50-year-olds, 55-year-olds, you know, and part of my work, I get a lot of phone calls of folks who want to be a part of the solution, but the training and the upskilling is a big problem um, with folks, particularly those that, are, that speak another language. They're not being promoted or given the opportunity to seek different opportunities in these uh, workplaces. Odds, oh, you wanted to I, add to. I, I want to listen to all of you. Yeah. So, so I would just add that if you look at the leadership of the healthcare industry, I want to ask those leaders, when was the last time they stepped into a high school? It's really important that as hiring folks in leadership roles, and those that are rubber meets the road, they need to understand what the needs are of the student population. We're, it, there's a detachment. So that embedded services and promoting of support for teenagers, I think is critical. 
Why don't we have a rotation where the leadership of the hospital spend maybe a couple of days in each high school to understand how they can contribute in a much deeper way? Community benefits are fantastic, but it doesn't stop there. Because if you understand what the community needs, then how do you then make sure that that need funnels through the entire 80,000 folks? Because it's really important that there's a connection between what the do Dr. Claire does here in the community, and then how do you implement it at each of the sites? So Dick, you know, when you put out a policy, sure, everyone listens to that policy, but how does it get embedded? You have to feel it, touch it, see it. And I do agree. I so appreciate what you said. I'm one of those teenagers. I would have fallen off the face of the earth if I didn't have a job and a mentor. Someone that cared enough to say, you're not doing well. I was working at 16 and failing high school in Brighton High. I was one of the kids that was bust. So that's how old I am. There's a ghost. But the bottom line is that I had someone that cared. Single parent. She couldn't do everything. Someone cared enough. Now, we can't do that for everyone, but I think in, in, in aggregate, I think we can definitely address some of this. I think it's terrific. By the time you're 15, if you don't have some sort of pathway, you're already falling off, no matter, no matter what community you come from. And so I think there's an importance there. Plus, it's selfish. If you're an employer, you're already nurturing and you're already orienting and you're already guiding that person to work within your structure. So by the time they graduate from high school, they know the manager, the manager knows them. The, nur the clinical nurse knows them. And then so forth, there's an investment of human touch, which is, I think, what we're missing at times. So I think, I think it's really important. When we get to some of the statistics, I would like to just share that part of the challenge for healthcare right now is that many of, I'll just use nurses, because I love my nurses. The nurses, many nurses left during COVID. The reason they left, they could have worked a few more years. If they're a certain age, they didn't want to have that risk. So those folks that filled jobs on a per diem basis or on a temporary basis that were the call from you know, the nurse scheduler to say, Oz, can you come in? I'm really in a bind. That pool of folks are gone. So that's another whammy that was impacted for, for filling jobs. Those nurses didn't come back. That the credentialing is really difficult. So I want to talk about that. And then the other piece I would like to say is, and I'm hoping we can address this, Training centers are not, for CNAs, you have to be a skilled nursing center to get the training. There's only a handful of skilled nursing centers in Massachusetts. So in other words, if you're a CNA, if you don't go through that funnel, you cannot get certified. Acute hospitals should have that regulation eliminated so they can train in acute care. So it's archaic policies that, still, that need to be changed. So really thinking out of the box is critical. We struggled so much. We came to RCC, we went to the state, we worked with Elder Affairs to change that policy and it still hasn't changed. So if you're a CNA, in order to get certified, you have to go to a skilled nursing center. Not all skilled nursing centers are training centers. So I think that's just one area that we need to address. Thank you, Oz, for sharing that. One of the things, lessons I'm hearing is, you know, a lot of times, the old strategies that were used weren't bad. You know, we got rid of a lot of youth programs um, for in the last couple decades. And what I'm hearing from each of you in your own way is let's bring back some of the old strategies and start, start young. Other comments, yes. I'm very glad to be here. I'm learning a lot. But uh, there are so many issues at Mass General. We never talked, I was in a leadership program, and we never talked about health equity, never. And um, CNNs just became CNNs in the past 10 years. That's a new area for them. And then we also have the issue of um, mass and CAS. You know, that's a very big problem for health equity. So um, I'm glad to learn about health equity here and to learn about what people are doing to um, promote it. Thank you. So I'm from Haiti originally and um, came to the U.S. at 15 and trained at Howard University and came here and I was so excited, the best place, I'm going to be a Harvard resident, et cetera. And I wasn't exposed to a lot of the health equity and community health issues. And, and when I chose a career in community health, when I would go to the top 
hospital leaders and say that's what I wanted to do. They said, don't you want to be a doctor? And I was like, I am a doctor. I just want to be a doctor in the community. And people couldn't even, they just didn't understand why I was destroying my career, basically. And so I think we've come a long way, though, now. I think, you know, as I'm looking and listening to us, I hope that we can build on what we've learned. And I have to say that within my you know, career, I have seen, and, and I, I shouldn't say this, but I actually look younger than I am. I'm about to celebrate 25 years of being a doctor. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, so I think one of the, the big things I've realized is that we've come a long way. For one now, um, I'll take Mass General Brigham because you made the comment about Mass General. Um, we, two years ago, took a pledge to be explicitly united against racism. And it seems like a thing that everyone was doing, but it's actually really hard. We had to have our entire leadership team say, we are united against racism. It's everywhere. There are policies. What our priorities are are linked to it. And it comes with three separate pillars. It's who we are. How are we hiring people? How are we retaining people? How are we promoting people? And that means every leader is held to think about these three steps, right? And then we have a group looking at make sure we are moving from whatever number we're at to another number so it's not just a commitment in words, but a commitment in action. And then the next is looking at our patients. And you would think that, you know, we're a health system. So we want everyone to have equitable care. So if we find that someone or a group is dying younger or having more bad outcomes, it'll be an easy conversation. I'll just be like, oh my gosh, you know, nurse so-and-so or surgeon so-and-so, I'm looking at your data and it looks like there's a trend. What should we do, right? But that's hard, this is my colleague. She didn't wake up thinking she was gonna treat someone differently, right? No one is, ex you know, there's like, there are explicit actions and there are unconscious behaviors, all of them are in there. And then some of them, is not even them, it's the system. Wh what insurance you have, mm -hmm. where you live, whether the interpreter was there, all of those things. And the system has taken this commitment and actually gave money to departments to go and study and share and say, hey, we're restraining people of color more in the emergency room. How are we gonna change that? We're, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last one is, of course, the, the work I do in the community. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that, you know, the youth programs are an important piece. I know that you know a lot about our youth program. And um, as we look at what we're doing, it's about 200 students at least every year from the city of Boston, different public schools that come through our hospitals and start early. And we expose them to career and healthcare. And I always like this idea because um, you know, in middle school, we have a summer experience with them, and then throughout high school, they come, and then for the last two years, they actually get paid so that they choose to work in a hospital. And then we pair them with mentors, so they may be in respiratory or in the cafeteria or with a researcher. And um, we look at the data, and at the end, they graduate and they go to high school, and we, we actually give a, a, a bit of a scholarship to them so that it helps them as they, as they go to college. And, um, one day they asked me to be on the committee to review the scholarship applicants. And it was my first year. So I got really nervous because I was like, what if I score someone who actually needs it? Like, just because you got good grades doesn't mean you should get the scholarship. Because someone who got a C may actually need the opportunity to be seen. Maybe they had a learning disability. They're trying, so they should also. So I'm like stressed about reviewing it and so on and so forth. And we score it, and at the end, they tell me everyone gets the scholarship. So, <laughs> so what we found with this data is this. After 10 years of looking at these 200 kids per year, they are more likely than their average in the city and in the state. For the last cohort, 100% of them graduated. The second is, they're more likely to go to college during the 90% men who received the scholarship. They're more likely to stay in college because in the fifth year or so, halfway through, we started realizing that they had more stress. They get in, everybody has a laptop. When it's holidays, people can travel home, they can't pay for it. So we started offering additional support, including mental health support. So for the programs, we have a therapist who supports them. And we started to look at all of this, which is where you're saying we should be creative, which is it's not just the hospital. Because if you ask a hospital, they don't have a therapist for high school students going to college. But we needed to have that in order to really invest in them whether or not they were going to come back to our walls. And some of them did, and some of them are now directors of nursing and so on in our department. So that's just a small piece over the past 10 years and a great renewed commitment over the past two years, but it's not enough. And that's why I'm saying 
I like that the Health Equity Compact is saying that we need to make that maybe a requirement for every hospital, or maybe not just every hospital. We're number one in life sciences. Should it be a requirement for every pharmaceutical company? Does that make sense? The idea is that we should think bigger and better as we go. Quick thing. It just made me think of, um, so the program SSJP, I go to speak to it every year. Um, and I think every hospital institution should have something similar. I've talked to the young people, and one of the things that come up all the time um, is that it's just like an apprenticeship in a union. You get to actually see what makes a hospital run. And so they're able to see 30 different fields in a short period of time. So they, they, they could be in healthcare administration. Um, they might want to work in OBGYN, um, but they would not know these things existed if they didn't have these apprenticeships throughout the year. And I want to say something about the health equity space thing. We have to get to a point where equity is just not a buzzword. And the reason why the health equity compact was filed, and this is an important piece, is we have legislated harm in this country, in this state, for decades and for generations. And so in order to rectify the harm that has been legislated or not discussed or not taught, um, we have to actually put it in legislation. And the most exciting thing about the Health Equity Compact is to create a cabinet level office of equity um, mm -hmm. that is super important because we've realized that health is actually connected to every other piece of legislation. I also filed legislation on sickle cell and I just wanna share this quick story. Um, I didn't know anything about sickle cell I didn't know that black people are predominantly uh, sickle cell patients um, until one of my friends said that her whole family had the trait. Sadly, her sister just passed away. Um, but many of the folks out of the Massachusetts Sickle Cell Association, we have Vertex in Massachusetts that's leading yes. nationally, okay? Leading nationally right here in the city of Boston and still was a disconnect between patients, hospitals, and this national leader. Um, one of the young men came and said, you know, we're in excruciating pain all the time, but every time I go to the hospital, they think I'm chasing meds. Mm -hmm. They send me home. They tell me to take Tylenol. I'm literally dying of pain because so many doctors and nurses do not know about sickle cell disease. And so we have a national leader here. We have national hospitals, and we have a disease that's predominantly impacting people of color, and yet every time they, they're use, using the emergency room or primary care doctors, they believe that they're chasing pain meds instead of actually solving their pain because they think black people can handle pain better. So these are some of the ways in which um, sickle cell is just one example, but um, there's a huge issue with understanding that diversity and equity are not the same thing. Equality and equity are not the same thing. Some people need more, and, and that's what we're trying to do with this legislation. Excellent. Thank you. We promised to get you out by 10. Or we could go, this conversation could go on for the next hour. We're very, very blessed to have these dedicated uh, practitioners and uh, politicians, politician, mm -hmm. uh, who cares deeply about these issues. I'm going to ask my colleague, Marta Rosa, just to summarize what she heard in terms of potential rec recommendations and strategies. Marta, you have uh, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> that was more like one second. Um, so the, the first, thank you so much. This was absolutely fabulous. Um, there's this sense, sense of urgency. Did you feel it? Yeah. How many felt the urgency? Yes, Ex excellent. There's a need for action, right? Need for action to ensure not just access, but equity in healthcare. That's what I heard. Um, this life expectancy thing, critical. Our people are dying. That's the urgency. It's not just about providing care, it's about making sure our people are not dying, right? There's hope. Claire, you gave us a little hope over here. Um, the, the expertise that's aligned um, on ensuring movement on health equity and access right now with you all and the, the compact and all the institutions that are involved. Um, but then uh, Oz reminded us that there's a need for shared pathways and degrees, and a need to change old structures that don't work anymore, and a need to maybe pull out some of the things that used to work really well, right? 
Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, there's a need for the health industry to decide that the workforce needs to be diverse, racially diverse, and in all ways diverse. And I have to say, the lift experiences that you've all shared, let's use our lift experiences to dig into our passion so we can promote more action on these issues. It's not implicit, it's explicit bias, racism. Let's not mask it. Did you hear that? Yes. Can't mask the, the racism that exists in our communities. So that's confronting the hard truths, right? And we in Massachusetts are not the best, you all. <laughs> Did you know that? Did you all know that? We're not the best. Um, so that's a reminder of the urgency that we have to feel to work on these issues. It is about life and death right now in communities of color. Oz reminded us that it's collaboration that's going to get us to a better place. Aligning our talent is critical. 45,000 vacancies. 45,000. That's a lot of jobs, you all. Right? So building those pipelines are, are really important. Um, and who gets hired matters. So I'm going to share three things, Jackie, and then I'm done. The power of our lived experiences and truth-telling, critical. The need to call out explicit bias and racism, critical. The magic of figuring out how to share talent and make connections and strengthen the relationships across agencies, across individuals, across uh, industry. There is a role for everyone, you all. And so identifying that role is critical. Collaboration is key. Can't do the same thing expecting a different result. That is the definition of insanity, right? If you look up insanity, actually, I think that's what it says. <laughs> the need to empower communities, especially our young people. We have a responsibility to the next generation, you all. Did you all get that? It's, it's a big burden, right? Didn't, I felt that burden. There is a responsibility uh, to empower the next generation and expand and deepen their knowledge about their own community and their own stuff. And the last comment I'll make, think out of the box. Claire said, think out of the box. <laughs> Dr. Anderson said, think out of the box to make necessary change happen. Um, and the last thing, we need not just a commitment in words. How many are tired of the words? <laughs> but we need action, all right? So not just a commitment in words, but we need action. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Marta. Thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, all of this information will be put together as part of a report on Roxbury Community College's 50th anniversary and will be shared with our next president so that we can continue the work and continue to help to lift of this community and all of us. So thank you all. Wishing everyone uh, the best during this holiday uh, season and for a healthy, safe uh, 2024.